All right, thank you, everybody. We're returning from our break, and we're going to have uh, Dr. Susan Gould, who is um, a professor of internal medicine and health management and policy here at the University of Michigan. She's going to talk a little bit about uh, the Bishop family and the Bishop legacy. Good afternoon and welcome. Delighted to be able to say something about the Bishop family, um, doctors Ron and Nancy Bishop, uh, both graduated from this medical school, I believe in 1944, something like that. And um, uh, Ron Bishop joined the faculty in 51 and I got to know him when I was just getting here to do fellowship and start my career, um, he would come to my bioethics journal club. And so we met every month and he and his wife were both also very involved in the community and in efforts, particularly around issues of justice, which are, of course are near and dear to my heart. And so I was uh, pleasantly surprised when his family contacted me and said they had left a bequest to support a bioethics lecture. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, great. And since then, the whole family really has often been here to enjoy the lectures and has supported the lectureship. Um, Ellen Bishop is here today. She's the lone Bishop member, family member uh, today the, um, in person, but I believe Christine Maybe joining us, re pardon? Right, Christine and David, I believe, are both live streaming it or listening to it or something. So um, I think the whole family has been supportive of this center and our program here for many years. And I'm not supposed to say much because we're running out of time. So thank you and welcome. I'm also not supposed to say much, but as we all know, I can say much and be quick. So um, Michelle Mello is our honored guest today, um, a professor of law at Stanford Law School and professor of health policy in the Department of Health Policy at Stanford University School of Medicine. She conducts empirical research into issues at the intersection of law, ethics, and health policy. She's the author of more than 220 articles on medical liability, public health law, the public health response to COVID-19, pharmaceuticals and vaccines, biomedical research ethics and governance, health information privacy, and other topics. The recipient of a number of awards for her research, I could take the whole hour just listing them, um, Dr. Mello was elected to the National Academy of Medicine at the age of 40. Um, from 2000 to 2014, she was a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, where she directed the school's program in law and public health. She now teaches co courses in torts, public health law, and health policy. She holds a JD from Yale Law School, PhD in health policy and administration from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and MPhil from Oxford University, where she was a Marshall Scholar, and a bachelor's degree from Stanford University. Thank you very much, Dr. Mello, for joining us, and we can't so wait. Much. Thank you, Professor Specter Baghdadi, for uh, interviewing our honored guest. Thanks so much, Dr. Jaxi. All right, we're just gonna well, we're just gonna turn on the lights uh, for the folks okay. in the live stream and turn off this so we can all see you better. All right. Well, while they're getting set up, yes. thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Mel, for coming to join us. Um, so you have had such an incredible background, only of which was hinted to by Dr. Jaxi. So I was wondering if you could kick us off talking a little bit about your background and how you became interested in this, the intersection of health and medicine in this area and law. Sure. Um, before I do that, I just want to add my thanks to the Bishop family. I, I think I can't overstate on behalf of everybody in the room how meaningful it is for us to be able to gather in person like this. Uh, after such a difficult period, it's really, really important. Um, and I also think it's a really important national moment for us to pause and reflect a little bit on things that we've learned about um, good governance, about instilling ethics into public policy, and that's what brings us together today. So thank you very much for giving us that opportunity. Um, I first got interested in these types of topics um, as, as a teenager. Uh, asking kind of very basic teenage questions about what it means to live in a democracy, and in particular, what is it that we all owe one another? 
in a democracy? What are the obligations of citizenship? How do we promote liberty and the, the other values that makes our polity strong while at the same time making sure that people's basic needs are taken care of? And that led pretty naturally into thinking about public policy and about social policy in particular. And um, I, I did go abroad for a couple of years, as Dr. Jagsey said, uh, to learn about how the Europeans thought about these issues. I did a, a degree in comparative social policy and then came back and um, decided on this somewhat unusual, <coughs> excuse me, unusual combination of a law degree and a health policy degree to think about um, how to contribute to, to this, this set of issues as a legal scholar. Um, like many of us, uh, what I was working on, you know, came to a screeching halt in March of 2020. And uh, along with all of my colleagues in the medical school at Stanford, we all just sort of pivoted to thinking about COVID and what it was that our distinctive expertise could perhaps contribute to the national fight. And that um, has led me into a long series of um, papers and investigations about different aspects of COVID policy and ethics. Great. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that you should say that. I think we all aspire to have teenagers that will sit around pondering democracy. <laughs> um, but that's that's great that that's what drove you into this. Um, you know, so you bring up the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, that we've heard a lot about that so far today, um, because I think many of our experiences were similar to yours. Could you talk to us a little bit about this this incredibly interesting intersection of public health law and bioethics? and some of the major challenges you saw in COVID-19 in that intersection? Yeah, so it's, I mean, I was a little surprised to have been invited to give this lecture because it is supposed to be about bioethics and I do think about bioethics, but mostly what I've been thinking about is what are we doing legally in, in public policy? And I, and I guess my most basic answer is that hopefully we're moving towards policies and laws that reflect some shared moral intuitions about how we want our, our, to govern ourselves and take care of one another. And so that's kind of been the driving force in some of the work that I've been doing related to COVID. I think there are some really key ethical tensions um, relating to aspects of COVID that have translated into legal battles and public policy battles. And I mean, I can just overview a few, I'm happy to drill down on them later, but at the most fundamental level, you know, the fight as, as you well know here in Michigan has been about the tension between individual liberty or particular people's conception of individual liberty and public health protection, uh, about where the sphere of autonomy that we are all entitled to ends and the sphere in which uh, the government legitimately has something to say about our behavior begins. And we've just obviously seen that play out in so many areas, whether it's vaccination policy, mask mandates, um, restrictions on religious and other gatherings, which really implicate core notions of uh, religious liberty, associational rights under the First Amendment, um, stay-at-home orders that have actually involved our physical liberty in a, in a really unprecedented way, honestly. Um, and more broadly, fights about the extent to which health officials get to do these things to us with relatively modest accountability. I mean, to be honest, our legal framework for public health emergency response has very slender reads of accountability during the pendency of an emergency. And that, um, you know, that was born of an era after 9-11 where the kinds of emergencies that we anticipated were short term, you know, an act of terrorism, bioterrorism in particular, what would we need to do to get us through that time? Um, no one envisioned a two year pandemic of global proportions and the need to keep these kinds of restrictions on liberty in place for months and months or years and years. So this kind of core tension is not adequately addressed in the law and so we've seen it getting fought over in all different kinds of venues from the courts to the philosophy journals. And there's just a really ser interesting series of tensions that are playing out there. So I've talked about some of the particular policy contexts already. There are others as well. I think kind of the second biggest issue beyond these dimensions of liberty and public health orders has been around privacy. We've had a national conversation about 
the privacy rights that we are entitled to during the pandemic, um, relating, for example, to uh, the extent to which our employers or the government ought to be involved in tracking our location for purposes of contact tracing. Should we all be having these apps on our phones that allow Apple or Google or our local health officer to figure out who we came into contact with? And then, of course, debates about informational privacy, too. Do you get to know if I've been vaccinated? Do you get to know if I've been exposed before we sit down and have a mask off conversation? And uh, you know, anyone who's on Twitter knows that Americans have some very interesting ideas about what privacy law protects that, um, as you've said many times on Twitter, relate not at all to what privacy law actually protects. So the law gets implicated in these debates about privacy in um, ways that you know, reflect misunderstanding, but um, also maybe reflect ways in which our privacy laws don't actually enshrine people's moral intuitions about what ought to be protected. Um, so that, that's been a second very interesting conversation. And then I'll just mention a few other, I think, interesting bioethics problems from among many that have arisen. Uh, one, I think, relates to disparities and health equity. When we've seen the pandemic have such a disparate impact on particular communities, I think important conversations have taken place about our obligations to render aid to those communities, particularly when they're existing within states that haven't been doing much to help. Um, and then globally, what are the obligations of first world countries to lower income countries around vaccine distribution and foreign aid? Those are fights that we're having right now, you know, as we decide whether we're going to continue USAID funding for uh, coronavirus control in, in, the, in the global south. Um, there are really interesting ethical issues, I think, around triage, as we've been, just been talking about, uh, in terms of healthcare resources and around vaccines, who gets them, in what order and why. And then finally, um, I think there are really interesting series of conversations that have been going on about how to do science in an epidemic. Um, you know, the explosion of science has been absolutely astonishing when you look at the number of papers that have been published. And it raises really interesting questions about something I know you're really interested in, like how much can we accelerate science through more data sharing, which is something that really worked during the pandemic. But also some um, maybe cautionary notes about doing science really fast. How, mu how much breaks do we want to put on science to ensure a really high quality product? And then some interesting questions about research prioritization is I think one thing that many people don't realize is there were actually too few COVID patients to do a lot of the clinical trials that people wanted to do. And so there were fights within many institutions, including my own, about who gets the patients to enroll in trials of COVID therapy. And uh, it kind of exposed a lack of process for prioritizing among competing research uh, initiatives. So, so many things that we could talk about. Those are just a few. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, so one thing I'll start with is you mentioned sort of local public health governance, mm -hmm. but also federal privacy rights such as HIPAA and other things at the federal level. Um, I think it has been a bit confusing to a lot of people the difference between state versus federal enforcement in the public health law space. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about federalism and perhaps why public health law is set up like this and what are the, some of the limitations as it was applied in COVID-19? Yeah, so there are lots of people who are um, you know, really dissatisfied with the federal response in the, you know, I'm gonna say in the first couple of years of the pandemic for one set of reasons, and in the second couple of years of the pandemic for a different set of reasons. Now we've got a federal government that would really like to be deeply involved in the response, but is running up against lots of legal limitations on doing that. Just seems like every time they try to do something really aggressive, the courts beat it back. And that's federalism. So, uh, you know, for better or for worse, our constitutional structure has long provided for states and local governments to be the main engines of public health lawmaking. The federal government gets to do lots of things, but only if it can tie it to a specific jurisdictional hook in the Constitution, like uh, Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce or the national security power, the taxing power. There's no uh, federal, what we call police power, this very broad power to do things to promote public health, welfare, and safety. And so that has meant the federal government has to be very careful about what it does. And it has meant that states have basically been running the pandemic, or at least were for the first couple years of the pandemic. Um, and there's long been concerns about that framework for, for um, mostly sort of worrying that, 
It gives too much discretion, um, particularly when paired with a lot of emergency preparedness laws that give special powers to both st state and federal lawmakers in times of emergency. Again, there's not enough accountability. Um, and that that these powers would be abused. Um, what, <laughs> what was surprising about the first couple of years of COVID is that to the contrary, the federal government in most people's estimation did too little. You know, it just kind of abdicated responsibility even to exercise the powers that it did have. Um, and so it, it caused a lot of us who are, think about federalism to kind of have little thought experiments about what would this pandemic have looked like without this federal structure? Um, and we might think about two kind of alternate realities. So, so reality A would be, what if we didn't make states do all this stuff and we had a much stronger central government? Um, but the federal response was inept. You know, uh, that they didn't do anything. They, they didn't put community mitigation measures in place. They didn't follow the evidence. They hadn't staffed the White House with people who knew something about public health. They weren't willing to listen to experts. They weren't willing to generate new evidence and follow it. Um, they hadn't invested in the public health system. Some of these things might sound familiar, right? <laughs> um, on the other hand, like reality B would be you have a really well-functioning federal government who did the opposite of all of those things, and then you'd have a much better outcome. Um, you know, I think we could all agree. As a nation, we would probably be better off if the federal government had been able to do the most effective evidence-based interventions for everybody at the optimal time. So I kind of think of federalism as a hedge against reality A. It gives us a second best solution in case we have a federal government that's either inept or tyrannical. And what it's meant is that we have this very kind of patchwork quilt of COVID responses that has left a lot of people feeling cold. Um, but there's, a, there's an argument that it's better than the counterfactual. You know, if states hadn't had that power, where would we be? Great, yeah. And so you mentioned um, some of the state emergency orders, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned individuals feeling strongly about perhaps rights being violated. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what kinds of emergency orders states have put into place and what kinds of claims people are bringing to the court in terms of violations of their rights? Yeah, I'll do my best. There have probably been close to, at this point, 15 or 1,600 lawsuits brought nationwide over COVID orders, so it's really hard to keep track. <laughs> the legal epidemiologists are doing their best. But uh, you know, when you look across these claims, it basically boils down to fights about three ethical principles. One's liberty, the second is what I might call fair treatment, and the third is political voice. So in the first category are the challenges you've probably heard the most about. So these are people who are upset about vaccination mandates, stay-at-home orders, business closure orders, restrictions on gatherings, things like that. Um, and they are asserting um, their religious liberty in many cases, particularly as against vaccination mandates, and as well as in the earlier stages of the pandemic, restrictions on how many people could gather indoors. Um, they're asserting um, what we lawyers call substantive due process rights. There are these sort of rights that the justices have read into the 14th Amendment of the Constitution that say we have some liberties. There's a zone of uh, autonomy into which the government can't enter without good reason. Um, so people, for example, who are unhappy about their business being closed, you know, would frame it in those terms. Um, there are claims about rights to travel. So uh, another constitutional principle is that we should be allowed to move from state to state and to be received as a citizen of the United States rather than an outsider because we don't belong in that state. And um, you may recall that uh, in 2020, a lot of states had restrictions on your ability you know, to come in, to fly to Hawaii or go camping in Maine without quarantining. And so a lot of those rights were raised as part of that. Um, we've talked a little bit about freedom of association already for, for gatherings and whatnot. That's a core first Amendment right. Um, and then I'd also sort of put in this bucket claims about rights to informational privacy because sometimes that's viewed as a constitutional right as well. So these are all liberty-based claims. Um, and then in the second bucket are, are claims about fair treatment. Sometimes litigants have tried to frame um, public health orders as discriminatory because they draw lines between two groups of people in a way that can't be justified. Um, for example, between people who are gathering for religious purposes and people who are gathering for other purposes or people who are um, going sh shopping in a grocery store versus the same number of people in the same size space who are gathered for a different purpose. 
Um, so they're just sort of alleging arbitrariness in these classifications. Uh, and then there are a bunch of claims about essentially the right to be free from arbitrariness when the government acts. Um, and historically in public health law, these kinds of claims are about people who've been put into isolation and are trying to get out. But these, the claims have now morphed into much more general claims that all have the same kind of flavor, which is that some health officer did something without going through a formal rulemaking procedure that would have given people political voice, allowed them to comment on this rule, allowed them to oppose it, and this thing just kind of got swept in and there's no procedures for kind of undoing it. Um, or uh, this thing got imposed without a reasonable basis and I didn't really have an opportunity to challenge it. Um, and then the final uh, bucket of challenges <clears throat> which have to do even more with political voice, there are lots of claims that are saying, um, hey, I, I get that some part of the government could probably do this thing to me, but not this part. Not this health officer, it needs to be a state legislature, or not this state that needs to be federal, or not this federal agency, it needs to be state. Or most commonly, not this local unit of government, that's a state function. So for example, school districts can't require vaccination mandates if the state isn't requiring it. So lots and lots of fights about levels of government and um, all of this kind of ties back to this basic sense that we wanna keep policymaking close to the people so that there's more accountability. So people get very upset um, when, when that doesn't happen. Um, so how are all these claims faring? I mean, it's a really mixed bag. Some of them haven't had many wings at all. Claims about, you know, I have a right to keep my business open, for example. I'm not aware of any of those that have succeeded. But claims that are about really core uh, rights and liberties in the Constitution, especially First Amendment rights, are finding traction in some jurisdictions. And to some extent, also actually at the Supreme Court when we're talking about religious liberty. Um, for lots of other kind of claims, I'll just give the lawyer's answer, it varies from state to state, you know, because a lot of these are state law claims, um, even though they kind of sound in constitutional principles. And what we're really seeing that's so interesting as varying from state to state and circuit to circuit, as you know, is um, different degrees of deference that judges are willing to give to policy decision makers. Um, for the last 150 years of public health law, the presumption has always been that if an expert policymaker did something in public health and it wasn't crazy, you know, there was some rational basis for that thing and some basis for thinking it was necessary, they get to do that thing, unless it's in clear contravention of a constitutional right. And that deference is really eroded in particular judicial pockets around the country, especially in Texas and the southern states, uh, to some extent in Wisconsin and in the, in the Midwest as well. Um, and now judges are really starting to second guess some of these decisions that apply their own independent analysis of public health risks and benefits. So um, that kind of throws a monkey wrench into very long settled presumptions about public health law and about who's in charge. Yeah. So, so you brought up a lot of claims based on discrimination. And also in your answer to your first question, you talked a lot about health disparities mm -hmm. that I know, you know, many of us have observed and captured um, and it, the effect of COVID-19 on different communities. Um, perhaps anecdotally, at least in my reading of the newspaper, the people who are bringing claims on uh, discrimination are not necessarily from the communities who are experiencing mm -hmm. the highest disparities. Is there any hope in the law to help um, communities that are affected the worst by some of these COVID-19 mm -hmm. disparities in ensuring greater resources? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I've wondered about that for a long time. Um, and there's only recently been any scholarship at all on this question of whether civil rights laws are helpful in trying to address health disparities generally, and then now during COVID. Um, and the answer I, I think is it's really hard, you know, because a, our constitutional rights and even the rights that are protected by statutes in this realm are pretty limited. Um, only certain groups are protected, but the biggest limitation is that generally you have to be able to show that the thing the government did that disadvantaged you was done with intent to disadvantage you. Not just knowing that you'd probably be disparately impacted, but intentionally out of some kind of animus about your, your group. And that's just really hard to prove. 
So, you know, in a variety of contexts from hospital-based discrimination claims to now in public health, it's been hard to kind of see a path. But um, what does encourage me is I think lawmakers since George Floyd have started thinking a little bit more creatively about how to use non-civil rights laws to try to improve health equity. I mean, federal programs are the obvious way that we can begin to do this to provide money for services that these communities need and to target them to particular communities to expand Medicaid, to expand other programs that we already have that provide a social safety net. Um, but there's some interesting experiments as well. Um, one that caught my interest is in California, we had, like many states, these different tiers that you had to move through to get out of jail during COVID, right? So you, had, you were in the red zone, you had this set of restrictions, and if you moved to orange, you got some of your rights back and so forth and so on. And um, like most states, we adopted specific criteria that had to be met in order to move. And it was based on the CDC's recommendations. But then California also did something new, which was to add an equity metric to that. So if the disparity between, in a particular county, the best off neighborhoods socioeconomically and the least well off neighborhoods socioeconomically exceeded a certain gap, even if you were doing well in like overall COVID cases or hospitalization, you couldn't move into the next tier. And so that provided the right kind of incentives for counties to start thinking about how to reallocate their money and their effort and their thinking to the least advantaged neighborhoods to try to pull the whole county up. And it gave everybody some skin in the game. Everybody wants to get out from under these restrictions, but they know that unless the neighborhood down the road gets the vaccines, gets the testing units, gets the dollars for schools that they need, we're not gonna do it. And in fact, we did see progress on many of those equity metrics as a result. So I thought that was really interesting, and I hope that becomes a bigger part of how we think about health policy. Yeah, that's really cool, and sort of the emphasis on how health policy is still so necessary, even in the space that's so heavily reg regulated. Yeah, and long. absolutely. Yeah. So changing a little bit to another topic that you brought up um, in terms of state emergency powers and um, rules that were set forth. I know a thing that a lot of my clinical colleagues were very concerned about at the University of Michigan was practicing outside the standard of care, in particular when our governor and other governors in other states never, never or had not currently called a public health emergency with this idea that with a public health emergency, there's some sort of waiver of liability for mm. practicing beneath the standard of care. Can you talk to us a little, have there been lawsuits? Has that been explored? Yeah, so I think, uh, like you, that was the question I got asked the most in the first few months of the pandemic from my medical colleagues, is what does this all mean for liability? Um, and there were some things that happened that I think were easy cases for answering that question. And then I think there are a bunch of things that happened and are still happening that I think are much harder cases. So the, the relatively easy cases are, are um, risks to patients or injuries to patients that happen because you're in the process of fighting COVID, like directly. You are allocating ICU beds to COVID patients. You are administering COVID therapeutics and vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. There, regardless of whether your state has a declared emergency or not, you get federal protection under something called the PrEP Act and other acts as well. And then many states, um, once an emergency is declared, will layer on additional state law protections. Um, another relatively easy case is when your hospital puts in a surge plan or when the state has said, time for surge plans. That again, in many states will trigger a set of liability protections, not just for um, healthcare practitioners, but for anybody who's kind of a responder to the emergency, even volunteers. Um, so people super worry about those <laughs> situations still because they know they're rendering care that, that is not at their usual standard. And they feel not unreasonably very uncomfortable about that, but you know, like many situations involving malpractice liability, the level of discomfort among providers outstrips the actual risk. Okay, so those are the easy cases. The harder cases come once the surges start to wane. And um, once we're talking about injuries to patients who um, are not COVID patients, but who um, have bad things happen to them because we changed what we did in the hospital due to COVID. So patients whose surgery was delayed and who had an adverse outcome while they were waiting. A patient who's come into a respiratory clinic and is asked to wait in the car and has a respiratory arrest in the car, whereas otherwise she would have been in the emergency room being observed. Um, patients with misdiagnosis who haven't gotten their usual level of primary care and the organization hasn't been focused on doing outreach. Um, and then patients who are in the hospital but 
maybe we, as we've been talking about, don't have the level of nursing or the nursing expertise that we usually would have, and so they don't get uh, as high quality nursing care. You're all, I think, probably familiar with situations like this that continue to arise in hospitals that are trying to recover from the last couple of years. And that's harder because there's not a clear and explicit statutory liability protection. But I think what I try to say to worried people under that set of circumstances is, you know, the common law is really flexible. Uh, and this is what I teach my first year tort students as well. When we evaluate any kind of negligence claim, the standard is basically what is reasonable under the circumstances. And um, juries and, and people who are bargaining for settlements in the shadow of a jury decision take into account the circumstances. And that means thinking about what a reasonable hospital should do or, or even could do in an emergency or a sort of post-emergent situation like we're in now. So um, you know, I'm not aware of cases where there has been big liability imposed as a result of some of these problems. And I think that standard of care is flexible enough to accommodate reasonable decisions about resource allocation and staffing. Now, that doesn't give anyone carte blanche to just keep on going with lower levels of nurse staffing in perpetuity. At some point, the set point is going to readjust. And when experts testify in the courtroom about what's reasonable, it's going to look more like 2019 reasonable, not 2022 reasonable. So we have to keep our eye on that. But um, I think there is greater forgiveness in the legal system than people realize. Great. Does everybody feel better? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so let's talk about something that is currently still very controversial, which is vaccine mandates. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of both legal and ethical tensions in who and what and how should vaccine mandates exist for COVID-19. Yeah. Can you talk to us more about that and where the major tensions you see are? Yeah, so starting with the ethical tension, I mean, this is exhibit one for where individual liberty butts up against public health protection. So, you know, the, the core question with a mandate is, when is the government justified in overriding an individual choice? Um, and a kind of corollary question is, is that role dependent? And it, why is it role dependent? If people have opted to serve particular professional roles, does that now mean they have a lower um, bound of autonomy? I think most people's moral intuition is, yeah, maybe for some, if you're a Navy SEAL or you're a intensive care unit physician, um, you, you probably have chosen to trade away some share of that autonomy, but where do we draw the lines? So does it, you know, should we have expected school teachers to think about that before they decided to become a school teacher, for example? Um, and then there are other questions about how much scientific certainty is enough to start forcing this uh, non-decision, to for, for forcing this intervention on people, um, you know, particularly early on after vac vaccine approval. We had a pretty good evidence base about effectiveness, but even these pretty large clinical trials are gonna miss some relatively rare adverse event. The approval basis for the vaccines was still this emergency use authorization. It wasn't full FDA approval. So at what point do we need um, to say, to, can we say we have enough evidence to justify taking away people's choice here? Um, and then I think a third interesting issue is how hard do we have to work to offer people less burdensome alternatives before we just say, look, we don't, we don't have to do this anymore. So, you know, a lot of employers opted not for a strict vaccination mandate, but a requirement that you either vaccinate or test every week, for example. That's a less burdensome alternative. Um, should we wait and see if people will do it voluntarily before imposing a mandate? How much like runway do we have to give these less burdensome alternatives before we declare them failures and move to something more coercive? And, you know, morally and legally, actually, we want to try the less coercive thing first, but it's a pandemic and that costs some lives. So these are really, really hard ethical questions. Um, there's also a broader issue that um, really, really worries people in the vaccination policy community, which is if we mandate this vaccine, what is it gonna to do to people's willingness to take other vaccines? So as everybody here knows, historically, vaccine objectors have been a really small group, like in most places, 1%, maybe 2% in some places, but really small. And um, 
that's not true. <laughs> you know, the vaccine objectors, the hardcore objectors are up around still up around 20, 25 percent. And we know that they're aligned with particular information sources and political leanings. And we know that the issue has become really heavily politicized. So if you push them to take this vaccine, is it going to affect their willingness to bring their kiddos in for uh, recommended childhood vaccines? The pediatricians are really worried about this because those kids are already behind due to not having primary care access during COVID. And now if they've got parents who are unwilling, once they're able to bring the kids back in, um, we could be you know, fighting a battle and, and losing a war. So it's really, really tricky, uh, just, just on ethical grounds. In terms of how this translates into legal battles, well, one of them has been about, can you mandate a vaccine that doesn't have full FDA approval? That got resolved as a yes. Um, the government helped clarify that uh, as it was a matter of statutory law. But then there, there are lingering pa uh, issues. One um, that I'm sure you've all heard about is whether particular federal agencies get to mandate vaccines. You know, usually vaccine mandates are from state health departments or, or legislatures. Uh, it's new, unprecedented for OSHA to require a vaccine like this or CMS uh, or um, other federal agencies. And that raises really kind of boring but important issues about how we read statutes, because statutes are what give agencies their powers. Congress says to agencies, look, we got a lot of work to do. You need to like work on the fine print of how we execute on this particular responsibility of your agency. So you can do a bunch of things kind of of your own accord. You have to follow certain procedures, but uh, you don't need our permission for everything you want to do. And um, during COVID, the agencies have really run with that. <laughs> so as a result, some of the courts have said, no, 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 this has to be something that, that Congress authorizes. It can't be something that an agency can do. Um, there are, of course, really important questions around religious exemptions. And this is another area where, you know, we legal scholars have kind of been gobsmacked by what has been coming out of the courts lately because it has, uh, you know, in 100 years of people filing religious challenges to vaccination mandate laws, no higher court has ever said that a state has to offer a religious exemption. They just haven't as a matter of constitutional law. There's statutory law for employers, they, sh they have to do it, but you know, states don't have to do that. And um, it's not clear where the, whether that's still true. So the, the Supreme Court in the last couple of months has declined two opportunities to rule on that issue, but the lower courts have not been uh, taking uniform decisions on this point of whether you have to offer a religious exemption and then if you do, how is it that you're allowed to accept, ass, assess those religious exemption requests? And there have been some crazy stuff going on, you know, like pastors of churches that have never had a problem with vaccinations before writing 2,000 letters for their parishioners saying that this vaccine is somehow contrary to the faith. Does that meet the standards for a sincere religious belief? Um, or can a Catholic whose own bishop has said, this, is, this vaccine is not contrary to the teachings of the Catholic Church, say, yes, but my interpretation of Catholic doctrine is it does violate my religious beliefs. Is that a thing? These are the things the courts are grappling with. They are still kind of all over the map, and we don't know how that's going to come out. Um, and then I think the final legal issue that bears mentioning is, again, these power struggles between localities and states. In, um, in states where the governor and the legislature is not inclined to do really aggressive things for COVID. Um, we've heard about these battles in Texas and Florida and other places where school districts want to mandate vaccines or masks and the governor doesn't want it. Uh, the legislature has passed a law saying you can't do this. Who gets, who gets a say over this issue? In many cases, it's just not clear. So um, it's a hot mess right now. <laughs> and again, uh, you know, very difficult to keep up with what's going on and also difficult to decide whether one wants the Supreme Court to weigh in, uh, given the current composition of the court. If you're very pro-vaccination mandate, you might prefer not to have that happen right now. Yeah. No, did somebody tweet that? Did we get that? <laughs> Michelle Mello says it's a hot mess. Um, yeah. So, no, I think that this is this really important and interesting point, the difference between how courts and state and local public health authorities started the pandemic based on the precedent of the past 150 years versus where we might be when this ends, right? So could you speculate a little bit? So say this pandemic ends mm -hmm. and then in a year we have another one. There's been so much change, even that's occurred already. Yeah. 
ignoring what the Supreme Court might do in the future, but the next pandemic, what's going to happen? What are the rules of the road? So what I'm worried about in terms of that is that um, in, at this point, most states, there have been efforts to try to retrench or roll back the powers that health officials and health departments have. And, um, you know, those come from some very uh, places of deep moral distress that people have about the degree to which their liberty has been burdened, the unaccountability, lack of democracy in the process, and so forth. So it's not... Um, Shocking that this is happening, but it is really concerning if you care about pandemic response. When you have state legislatures um, putting limits on the circumstances under which an emergency can be declared, the length of time it can be declared for, under, what can be done during that emergency, um, what processes have to be followed up to and including a formal rule, rulemaking process where you have to like spend months allowing the public to, to comment on your proposed rule and then answering all the comments and then making the rule final. I mean, this is no way to run a pandemic. So what concerns me is that we might be over rotating on our response to what I think is probably a real issue, which is that our emergency preparedness laws were not designed with this in mind and probably need some tweaking. But this is not a tweak. This is like <laughs> flipping the car over on its head and watching it sort of spin out on the highway. So um, that's what worries me. Not all these bills have been successful, um, but you know it continues to happen. Here in, just here in Michigan, in the last four months, there have been eight different bills proposed, one of which made it all the way to the governor's desk that would have significantly limited pandemic-related powers. And um, so I think what, what has to happen is we need to become more thoughtful about how to um, kind of do public health law modernization 2.0. After 9-11, there was this big effort to modernize our public health laws, which dated to like the 18, 1900s, um, to reflect our modern notions about people's rights and also the kinds of powers that we might need in an in a emergency. And we changed a lot. And um, for a long time, it was pretty functional. But this um, really swept away a lot of presumptions, as I've said. So we need to think about how to do that again to account for situations where we have to quarantine an entire neighborhood or an entire county or an entire state where it's not going to be for 14 days, it's going to be for 700 days. You know, how do we think about um, protections for people's justifiable assertions of rights and liberties in those kinds of contexts in a way that will rebuild a sense of legitimacy that has really been lost during the pandemic and enable effective governance next time around? Yeah. So one of the things that many of my colleagues focus on, as you probably noticed from the talks, is health communication. Um, and you also mentioned sort of the effect of COVID-19 on science. Um, and I know one frustration that some people have had is that the major public health governing bodies, both internationally, like the WHO, or nationally, like CDC, have been putting out public health messaging that is perhaps not congruent with the most up-to-date science. Like, for example, WHO pushing hand-washing long after we knew that COVID, you know, was in the air and also the CDC saying, you know, if you could get vaccinated, you could take off your mask after we knew that people could still catch it and give it to yeah. others. Can you talk a little bit about integrating science into public health communication and that tension between what's best for everybody versus what might be best for few? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm out of my depth here because I'm not an expert in, in health communication, but you know, I've lived through this the same as you all have and thought a lot about the communications coming out. And I share your sense that there's a lot of unforced errors coming out of Washington <laughs> um, in both presidential administrations around health communications. And, and so what might be going on here? Well, um, I mean, there are the, like the usual institutional explanations, you know, institutions are slow, agencies are slow. Uh, and they are balancing a lot of considerations. And, you know, I think there's merit to that, especially the louder thing. You know, this, um, after Trump, I think there was so much emphasis put in the new administration on this mantra that we're going to follow the science. We're going to follow the science. But in reality, uh, you know, I've never worked at CDC, but I don't think that they set policy solely based on what is most likely to quash this, this particular public health problem right now. I think that when we're talking about fighting COVID, they also are, first of all, evaluating health-health trade-offs. So as we know, some of the things that we do to quash COVID have other 
ill effects on health, whether we're talking about social isolation, mental health, um, or a variety of other things, economic distress. So there's that. But, you know, of course, they're also buffeted by lots of political forces, even in an administration that says they're going to follow the science. And so I, I think it's a mistake to kind of oversell the extent to which any government body can do that. You know, I think there are always going to be these these trade-offs. Um, so there are institutional concerns, but then I think there are just um, public communication problems. I think that people have a really hard time accepting that when science is working well, we change policies from time to time because we learn. Uh, people don't like policy reversals. They don't like being told to do X on one day and Y the next day. But people who are in, within the scientific community knows that that is science working well. If you have a new health risk, you learn about it, you adjust your policy. But that's very difficult to communicate. And so I think that's also been undergirding some of the reluctance to kind of make a new official pronouncement in response to evolving evidence. Great, thank you. And, and I will open it up for audience questions, but just one more. Mm -hmm. If I may, <laughs> on, on the first, some of the interesting stuff that you've been writing recently on sort of the intersection of the First Amendment and public health, you know, you recently wrote that our reverence for freedom of speech in the U.S. intensifies our vulnerability to public health mm -hmm. threats. Can you explain to us more about what you're thinking there? Yeah, I think, you know, in so many ways, freedom of speech is one of the central problems of our age, and it certainly is in public health. Um, the, the main problem that we face in terms of getting vaccine uptake is, is misinformation. It's information that is either knowingly or recklessly spread and that is incorrect about vaccine safety. Um, we know that that has dissuaded huge swaths of the American public from taking the vaccine. Um, and because of our court's particular conception of First Amendment rights, the government can't do very much about that. Um, so our Supreme Court, um, Dating back a fair ways, but certainly to a 2000 case called U.S. versus Alvarez has said, the fact that a statement is a lie does not mean that it's not protected by the First Amendment, except in particular realms like when it's said by a company. That's different. That's commercial fraud. But if I want to get up here and tell a lie, that statement may well enjoy First Amendment protection. And gosh, that's really problematic <laughs> because it means that there's really nothing the government can do to suppress speech that is untruthful, even, it's, even if it is like demonstrably false. Um, instead, what it has to do is uh, issue counter speech. So um, you all are familiar with counter speech from the, like the drug detailing context. We don't keep detailers out, but we can have counter detailers come in and tell you why you shouldn't use that drug. That's the idea is you fight a bad idea with a good idea. And it's a very appealing idea for judges that doesn't work at all in practice, especially with vaccine beliefs, which we know are super difficult to dislodge. Um, so it's this sort of elegant fiction about a marketplace of ideas that just doesn't function. And it's killing us when it comes to the vaccine, but it also bleeds over into other areas. Um, the First Amendment makes it really hard, for example, for the government to require warning labels on unhelpful products. When the city of San Francisco wanted um, Coke and other beverage advertisers to put on their billboards that excessive soda consumption was linked to obesity. No, legal challenge said, no, you can't force them to say that. Um, the FDA was in litigation for like 10 years over putting pictures, graphic warning labels on cigarettes. Because again, this is compelling speech, abridging First Amendment rights. Um, so really across the board, I think it's one of the, the thorniest problems that public health is facing. Unless it's telling pediatricians that they can't warn about gun safety. Oh, that's different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if you want to get your questions ready and uh, raise your hands and also for the folks who are live streaming again just show more on the YouTube so you can see the link to submit a question. Just make sure it's on Lauren. Thank you so much that was <clears throat> lovely and frightening all at the same time but <laughs> Um, I want to talk specifically about um, the issue. I mean, there's a sort of a traditional notion in pub. It's not working. There you oh. go. Is this one working? Yes. Hello, hello. Yes, we hear you. Putting it on the live stream, not so loud in here. But go ahead. Okay, I'll just shout then. <laughs> okay, so in public health ethics, 
you know, there's an idea that of restrictions on individual liberty, there has to be good evidence that that will, you know, prevent morbidity and mortality. Well, when you have a novel virus, you don't have good evidence of anything. And if you act too soon, people get mad at you. If you act too late, people get mad at you. And I'm just wondering sort of in, in, the, in the legal landscape, but also in sort of private policy, like what hospitals do, what businesses do. Um, what, how can we go forward with yeah. this? I mean, if, if that's the tenet of public health ethics and to some extent law, you can only do it if you have good, good evidence, but there are circumstances like this when you don't have it. Yeah. So then what? It's a great question. Um, so, you know, historically the answer in public health law has been, unless we're talking about something that again implicates a really important right, like speech in particular or religious liberty, if we're talking about just doing general things to a whole population, you don't always have to have a big evidence base. You just have to show that it's not irrational. And so for new threats or new therapeutics, new vaccines, these kinds of things, the courts were willing to say, okay, if a health official just said, look, you know, we had these experts, we reviewed this evidence, it seems plausible. Maybe they say other countries have done this or other states have done this or it looks similar to something that we've done for something similar in the past. That's good enough. Um, things are, are, are somewhat different. There are still lots of courts that will look at things in that way and be deferential. But um, especially where these other rights are involved, the courts will apply a higher level of scrutiny and they will require more evidence. Further, the kinds of laws that are viewed as implicating these rights is expanding. And the most important change there is that um, for a very long time, any law that was neutral with respect to religion, meaning it doesn't say anything about religion, and is a law of general applicability, means that it, it applies to us all, gets this lower level of scrutiny. And that has changed during COVID. The Supreme Court, in evaluating some California restrictions on gatherings, um, really kind of said, look, if the de facto effect of this thing is that it, um, it treats any non-religious activity or group differently than, than this religious activity or group, now it gets this much higher level of scrutiny. And that's a whole different ballgame because once you're in that category, the court is going to ask for evidence. And it's going to look behind the evidence. It's going to second guess that evidence. It's going to look hard at whether it believes the evidence. Um, and just to reach for again for the example of the graphic warning labels, that is a really hard standard to satisfy. So when the FDA wanted to do those warning labels, it had evidence from other countries. It had a modeling study showing the projected, based on survey evidence, field experiments, and epidemiological studies, what the projected impact on number of smokers was going to be. Lots of evidence not good enough. So um, that, that is really troubling to those of us who um, have some degree of skepticism about judges' ability to make better calls about these issues than health officials. Can you say something about the legality or illegality of a different approach than the mandates? And I'm talking about insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, providing financial incentives to be vaccinated or financial disincentives if you're not vaccinated. Yeah, it's a good question because, uh, you know, not just insurance companies, but a lot of, of state governments and local governments have tried to use various kinds of incentive programs to increase vaccination. They've gotten a lot of attention and they turned out to be not super helpful, but, um, but they're much more appealing <laughs> to certain polities than mandates. Um, so there are pre-existing uh, regulations for insurance companies um, that are generally referred to as the wellness regulations, and they allow insurers to surcharge or discount insurance premiums by a quite large amount for people who um, agree to participate in wellness programs. So the interesting question is, would this be considered a wellness program? And also, what do you do with people who um, have a, an objection to vaccination? Because the regs basically say, if there's someone who can't participate in this wellness program, you have to offer them kind of an out or an alternate thing that they could do. So maybe in this case, it's testing or something. But um, 
uh, insurers have not really used that power very much. People get really upset when they do. <laughs> when they make you go to Weight Watchers or attend a smoking cessation Zoom in order to get uh, avoid a surcharge on your insurance premiums, people get very exercised. The unions get very exercised about that. So it has um, only been used in the mildest ways to just offer, you, you guys are probably familiar with this sort of mild workplace rewards that you get for participating in these initiatives. So something like that is certainly permissible. The question is, could it do something that looks more like a penalty as an insurance company as opposed to as an employer? And I think that's less clear. I've got a question here from somebody online, and I'm just going to read this because I'm not sure I can par fully parse it right. Okay. Uh, do you think there will ever be a parallel conversation about reform slash new laws around more concrete laws slash restrictions? I think where this is going is trying to wrestle with the parallel. You brought the issue up of, of the need for reform, mm -hmm. as well as all of these things that are being put in place in the short term. Those seem like two conversations that might end up overlapping with each other. Yeah, I'm struggling a little bit with the question. I want to make sure I answer it, but I'm not sure I get exactly what the question is. So will there be like a longer term conversation about law reform? I hope so. I think so. Um, Right now, what we're seeing, again, is this very kind of reactive form of law reform that's motivated by public anger, you know, never a good start <laughs> for law reform. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that once things settle down and we can reflect a little bit more about lessons learned from the pandemic, that there will be a willingness on both sides to modulate a little bit. So for people on the red side to acknowledge that gosh, uh, we would have been in a really bad place if none of these emergency powers had been in place or if they had been um, enervated to such an extent that the people couldn't have moved quickly. Um, and people on the blue side to acknowledge that um, there are legitimate grievances around the ways in which these powers have been exercised and um, the failure to provide supports to people who are burdened by the exercises of these powers. And um, we can do both, we can address both of those problems with law reform as well. So I don't know. I suppose I'm probably too optimistic. <laughs> but I hope that in many state legislatures, that will be part of the conversation once we can take a breath and really um, get some distance on this. Thanks for a fantastic talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, so in uh, clinical ethics specifically, there's this mantra that uh, bad cases or crazy cases make for bad ethics and that we should be that comes from law professors. Uh, and, and, and I would love to hear from a legal standpoint of how the precedent that are being set by some of the most um, publicized cases coming out right now from a legal standpoint are influencing broader uh, either legal doctrine or even ethical practice across the country. Hmm, what a good question. Well, I think the area that comes to mind the most is just all the instability around what it means to respect somebody's religious liberty. I think that has really far-reaching implications far beyond vaccination. As we start to think about reproductive health, for example, conscience clauses, all kinds of things. If we were to expand very much farther this notion that any neutral law of general applicability that somebody thinks burdens their religion now gets heightened judicial scrutiny from a court that is very protective of religious liberty, Again, that like the tentacles of that are really far reaching. So that's, I, I think, what I personally worry about the most. Um, but you know, there are, there are other things as well. I think that the way in which this court has read um, some of the statutes that give agencies power is really problematic. Uh, there has to be some willingness to look at the spirit in which Congress delegated certain powers to the CDC or to OSHA, um, and not merely to look at the particular text. So for example, the CDC, this, the statute that authorizes the CDC to do quarantines has language in there about controlling vermin, rodents, pests, fumigating ships. Like it was designed in an area where the era where the big problem was ships coming in with rats and bugs. Now, should that statute be read to preclude the CDC from doing other forms of quarantine that, that address infectious disease? 
I would argue no, because the mere fact that that's not in the statute shouldn't preclude that kind of reading. But that's where the direction of many of these decisions have gone, and, and at times it's really been very surprising. And that also um, not only you know, portends instability when an agency issues these kinds of novel orders, you know, is it going to stick or is it not going to stick, but it could also potentially be chilling of an agency wanting to do things that probably are within its purview, but it knows it's going to be sued and be tied up in litigation, so maybe it's the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Well, unfortunately, our time has come to an end. And so um, I have to thank our speakers, um, both Professor Mello oh, thank you. and Professor Specter Baghdadi for those wonderful questions and to, to all of the audience. It was really illuminating, sobering at times, but very, very illuminating and exactly what we had um, hoped for. So thank you. For that. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your attendance and your participation and your engagement, uh, not only today, but throughout um, the past couple of years and going forward. Um, it really is such a refreshing experience to be able to share this space uh, with all of you uh, who are kindred spirits and engaged in like-minded work. Um, and so it's it's a privilege to, to direct the center. And uh, here's hoping for a lot more in-person interactions like this and no 700 day quarantines in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh my gosh, sorry. And please um, allow me to thank Valerie Kahn and Amy Lynn, our center manager, our center administrator, for actually making all of this happen to all of our staff who've been walking around making sure that the microphones are passed around um, and for everything they do all throughout uh, the year to make this center actually work. So I really suck for doing that as an afterthought, but it is the most important thing I've said all day. <laughs>